What is happening? Something is going on. Can you feel the wind? got introduced to the, the animal, animal mutilation thing, it actually was seeing uh, a piece that you had done for a news station. Well, in the context of my be being an investigative journalist my whole career, uh, since graduating from Stanford, and that my uh, beat has been the world around me, and specifically science, medicine, and the environment, it was in that context that in the summer of 1979, when I was working on a documentary for uh, the CBS station in Denver, that uh, I began realizing that there were a lot of articles in the newspaper about unusual animal deaths, not the first, but the second, third, fourth, fifth rounds of these unusual animal deaths in some areas, meaning that some ranchers had had reports and had reported to law enforcement uh, since the 1960s that they had had the same kind of unusual death which involved, and this is sort of the classic, when you hear the phrase animal mutilation, a phrase that started with law enforcement in the late 1960s in the United States. That's where that word began. It was reported in newspapers. It's stuck and there's, it's impossible to change it. An animal mutilation typically a cow, but can be a horse, goat, sheep, pig, rabbits, dogs, cats, and wild game such as deer, elk, marmots, and so forth. A huge range of animals around the world affected, including birds in the Canary Islands off the coast of Africa. Um, the typical animal mutilation involves the removal usually on one side of the body, an ear, an eye, a circle of flesh taken around the eye as if you would draw a circle with a compass on a piece of paper and everything inside that circle is removed to the bone. The jaw is quite often half removed so that let's say the right half of the face looks normal but the left half is completely uh, bone, white colored as if it has been in the sun. Uh, I've talked with many veterinarians who say that the stripping of the bones in these animals that have often been warm to touch when law enforcement have gotten to the scene is something that they do not understand because for a veterinarian, for somebody who is uh, trained to get the flesh and the cartilage and everything off of bone, there's only one way to do it, and that's to boil it, to boil this material off of bones. And yet around the world, uh, for at least uh, almost 40-some years, animals have been found with half of their uh, face tissue removed down cleanly to the bone in the photographs over the decades from so many different sheriff's offices from around the world and the United States show those clean bones. Inside the mouth, most of the time, the tongue is removed uh, deep within the throat, and often the larynx and the trachea is removed. A common description in veterinarian necropsies on these animals, you will find a phrase that says, and eight inches of the trachea had been removed surgically. But again, no blood. None of these uh, excisions have any blood or fluid. In fact, they are marked by being quite dry. And as you move down the animal, typically, when you get to the area where there would be an udder on a cow, or there would be a penis and testicles on a male that is removed in a high deep uh, oval, either large to take away the udder or six or eight inches in an oval to take away uh, the scrotum area. And then as you move further to the rear of the animal, uh, in almost 100% of the cases, there has been a hole cored out in the rectal or vaginal area or both and going uh, anywhere from uh, 6 to eight, uh, 14 inches into the body of the animal, often quite dry uh, like a tunnel, in some cases uh, not dry. And 
in a good percentage of the cases over the years, some portion of the tail has been removed, either the tail tassel or the half of the tail cut very, very cleanly, or all the way to the base of the spine, the entire tail is removed in a cut that goes through the spine, leaving the bone a very glassy, smooth, shiny-looking surface. And when you put all that together and you say that's the pattern of excisions and there is no blood and that most of the excisions, in fact, are completely dry and that around these animals no tracks can be found, not even the animal's own tracks, you can see why law enforcement going to those scenes in the 1950s, the 1960s, said to each other privately, Whatever is doing this must be coming to these pastures from the air because how does an 1,800-pound pregnant cow or bull get lifted or out of a pasture or something done to it that it does not seem logical that it could be done in the pasture where people come and go and then returned to the pasture without any tracks of any kind? And that is why this has been a substantial mystery for the last four decades. And as an investigative journalist concerned with what's happening in the world around me, when I got into the investigation of what was happening only in the state of Colorado, and that led me to all the rest of the United States, provinces in Canada, and literally around the world, and realized that I was dealing with a of crime or a crime scene that matched from city to city, state to state, uh, country to country, and yet many people that I would interview, for example, a sheriff in one state would not realize that the exact same thing was happening to animals in the state across his border. So when I did the film that was entitled A Strange Harvest, which was nine months of solid work, 18 hours a day, literally, just trying to come to terms with the size and the scope of the phenomenon and what law enforcement had to say, and what ranchers had to say, what veterinarians, the few who would talk on the record, had to say, uh, the independent work that I tried to do uh, with uh, doctors and medical people, and at the end of those nine months, after A Strange Harvest was first broadcast on the CBS station in uh, Denver on May 25th, 1980, it was a two-hour special that night, it was like a bomb went off. Uh, the phones started ringing at the station and didn't stop. It was like those uh, TV movies from the 50s. Uh, mail started coming in bags into the uh, station, and it all boils down to one perspective. I'm a television producer, documentary filmmaker. I just wanted to find out what was happening to animals first in Colorado and then around the world. I did a documentary. I told as honestly as I could what I encountered through their, the firsthand testimony of the people that I interviewed. And the fact that the film had people in law enforcement and others describing the beams of light and spheres of light and unusual phenomena in pastures where these uh, unusual animal deaths were found was a link to a non-human intelligence interacting with this planet, which kept being confirmed to me in off-the-record conversations with people who have served in the United States military and intelligence. And when the film was broadcast, and all of those letters and phone calls started coming in. What I realized as a TV producer and investigative reporter, I had only scratched the surface of an enormous iceberg. The film uh, provoked responses from people who were often writing or saying, I've never told anyone this before, but after seeing your television program, and then I would hear about the uh, unusual animal deaths on their ranch, or the strange objects in the sky that people had seen. And these were calls and letters coming 
not from only Colorado, but throughout North America and many from other parts of the world. And that has uh, been, to me, that has been one of the most fascinating of all of the stories that I've reported in my career. And after 30 years and thousands, <laughs> thousands, literally thousands of stories that I have done, this is the one that remains so mysterious to this day and has been linked itself by people in who have served in military and intelligence in the United States to a non-human intelligence interacting with our planet. 